All right, we're going to get the uh, live session going for Shaking and Lighting 2, week 3. Let's give everybody uh, another minute here to kind of roll in and uh, get situated. So this week we're going to be talking about uh, transmissions, primarily just focusing on glass, and uh, we'll go over some different things you're going to do for Activity 3.3. Uh, pretty straightforward project. We're just kind of building off what we were doing before in the previous weeks. It's, you know, as you guys know, it's sort of one you know, continuous project that we're just adding things to uh, over and over again. So uh, while we let people roll in here for just a second, I don't know if anyone's uh, currently in here or not, but if you are in here and you can hear me, uh, if you can just put a, something in the chat so let me know my audio works. It looks like it's working, but I always just want to double check to make sure uh, everything is streaming properly. So uh, just give me one second here. I need to grab a drink because my throat feels like the Sahara Desert, and it's going to be a rough lecture if it's like that. So uh, one second, I will be right back. All right, I'm back. Okay. We got my can of hydration. We're ready to do this. I uh, hope everyone's having a, a pretty good week so far. Uh, so I don't know who we have here, uh, who's hanging out with me, but welcome to the party. Let's get to going. All right, so uh, I'll kind of show you basically uh, the gist of what we're doing today. Um, we are going over fractions and transmissions. So uh, we're basically building off what we have before. Uh, I'm not going to bore you guys with going over every little minute detail of the whole project. A lot of this is covered in the videos uh, where I get into uh, a lot of detail on how all this stuff works. There we go. My laptop just freaked out for a second. Um, but the main thing we are going to be going over is basically just how to allow light to pass through something, which is a transmission. Uh, there's a couple of different types of transmissions, uh, which you guys know from, what you, you may know from Activity 3.2 if you've already looked at it. But we have a diffuse and a specular transmission. So we are going to get a little bit into uh, diffuse transmissions next week uh, at the beginning. But uh, this one's not really getting into that. Today we're going to be talking more about a specular transmission. But th the main idea, you know, we can kind of re think of this, uh, relate this back to something we did earlier in the month. I do want to uh, show you a couple things. So uh, if we have a, let's just kind of do a quick review here on a diffuse transmission. Uh, actually, let me uh, let's load up the project. Might be a little bit easier to explain it that way. So I'm not using the same. Um, sort of the same version of the scene that you guys, if you're in this class, that you're using. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't have materials on the wall yet. I haven't done the balcony stuff. This is uh, the first iteration of the project when you guys downloaded it back at the beginning of week two. But uh, the main thing I want to show you guys, actually, let's do a new camera here real quick so I can kind of focus on those bottles a little bit better. All right, I'm just making a new camera. Um, We'll call this uh, test cam. And we're just going to look through that and really quickly just get something a little closer to the bottles so I'm not uh, spending so much time rendering other things I don't really care about for this lecture. So we're going to put this camera right around here. I got a couple bottles, uh, sphere, random little uh, gemstones, and we're going to lock the camera down. So uh, if I render it and hit the little uh, blue R, we should get an image here with some fairly basic lighting. Yeah, nothing too intense right now. But 
uh, the main thing is we, we at least want to kind of think back to uh, week one and week two. And remember the difference between a diffuse and a specular trans, uh, sorry, diffuse and specular reflection. But uh, the important part is diffuse and specular. So what was really the difference between diffuse and specular? So most of you kind of remember from the discussion that diffuse simply means uh, basically the surface is rough. Light is going to scatter, so it's interacting with all these little imperfections, the way uh, the particles and the molecules are constructed. Light doesn't really hit it very smoothly, and so we have light that really just kind of ricochets and bounces off into all these different directions, uh, producing a diffuse reflection. So diffuse really just means it's rough. Um, Specular, trend, or specular reflection is uh, the opposite. Light still bounces off the surface, but in this case, because the surface is smooth, it is defined as specular. So they're both reflections. Both mean that the light is bouncing off the surface. It doesn't go through it. It's bouncing off of it. So it's opaque. It's solid. But it can do different things depending on the surface quality. So if we just did like a quick example with, um, uh, we'll just use this guy right now. I'm going to go to RenderMan and uh, just make a, a Pixar surface. Easy, right? We got that on there. Just hop in the attribute editor, let this update. Uh, I'm just going to do a crop, draw that over the bottle, turn the crop off, let it update right here. So a on the material, diffuse uh, reflection is defined in this one section up top. So this is our diffuse reflection lobe. Uh, basically, is your color. You can see when I bump that up makes it brighter, right? You go in here, you uh, change the color to something else. You can see, okay, the, the light's interacting it with it a little bit differently. Um, but we're basically just seeing the color, whether it's a texture or just a solid RGB value, multiplying against the light coming in. And we kind of get this final result. This is a uh, diffuse reflection. Uh, so it's, your, it's your probably the most obvious uh, material property. It's just color. Uh, we see it every day. We all know what it looks like. Now, specular reflection was a little different, right? Now, we can see it's in a completely different area. And the Pixar surface material is kind of interesting because um, they have a couple of areas that feel redundant because um, they basically do the same thing. Primary specular, rough specular, clear coat. And you probably remember from uh, the videos that's talking about this that uh, even though they are named differently, uh, really, they all do the same thing. They're just different areas where we can get these uh, specular reflection values to make it look shiny and polished. And the reason we have three of them is because for some surfaces, you want to get more of a layered specularity where there's like uh, uh, the rough undercoat, the, you know, the rough original surface. Maybe there's like a polish or something like a, a polyurethane on the top or there's like a clear coat that's on top of that. So it just gives us a little more control if we want to uh, build a complex layered uh, effect. But really, at its heart, it, we can just think of it in this one area. Primary specular, um, very easy to do a specular reflection. Uh, we can boost this up just a little bit. I'm going to boost the edge color up uh, doing a uh, Fresnel reflection. Uh, let me just kill the diffuse for a second, because I want you to see this by itself. So I'm just shutting off the diffuse reflection by turning the gain down. This is a specular reflection. So it's broken up in a different area, but it's the main difference here is because it's polished. We just get a slightly different look with the way the light is absorbed and how it reflects back to our eyes. And uh, we have a roughness slider uh, on the material to control how specular uh, or gloss we want the reflection uh, to be, or in this case, actually how rough we want it to be. Uh, there's another material in, in, in other softwares and renderers that have it uh, flipped the other way, where instead of you uh, defining roughness, you're defining glossiness. It's basically the same thing. But if you make it rougher, as you define it, the specular reflection is rougher, it becomes very matte. And this is actually still really similar to a diffuse reflection. So there's sometimes some confusion between these two. Um, if we have it very low, this is typically what most people think of when they think of a specular reflection. It's a very tight highlight, uh, you know, like polished metals, glass, um, you know, anything really shiny. So these are both uh, reflections. Rough, diffuse color, 
shiny specular reflection, right? So rough and shiny, does, but they're both bouncing off the surface. Now, if we just kind of take a moment to sort of remember that and then think of a diffuse and uh, specular transmission, it's kind of the same idea. Um, the main difference between the reflection and the transmission really just comes down to does the ray pass through the surface or does it just bounce off the surface? That's really it. Um, so in the case of a diffuse transmission, uh, the main difference would be like if we just kind of we'll kill all this, so we're not even thinking about anything reflective. Uh, the material is essentially a black hole; it's dead. No, no light is escaping it. Uh, if we come down into like the uh, the subsurface area, this is an area where we could generate a diffuse transmission. Oops, there's my mouse. Uh, diffuse transmission. And uh, we'll swap over to, we'll do like non-exponential path trace. Let me actually restart the render. because Sometimes it doesn't look 100% correct the first time you do it. There we go. Now this is a, a diffuse transmission and you can tell it, it's a couple similarities here. It has the same kind of like um, rough feel of a diffuse reflection, but the difference here is the light you're seeing here isn't light that's pass or that's bouncing off the surface, like coming from over here, ricocheting and then bouncing back to our eye. This is light uh, that's coming from around the surface, like even behind it, that's going through it. So light actually is traveling through this guy, but because it's diffuse, it's still rough. But because it's rough, the light scatters. It bounces inside. It's all these complex. Uh, equations for what happens to the light with index of refraction and how it's absorbed and you know how far does the light travel what's inside the material is it a is it are there different layers of, of material like a human skin where there's like skin flesh and bone it can get very very complicated but um, really it's just lights breaking up on the inside and some of it does escape through and we see <coughs> excuse <coughs> geez, we see that on uh, on the other side as a diffuse transmission but very, very similar to diffuse reflection. Light scatters inside as opposed to scattering on the outside. Now, that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, I want to do a little bit of an intro to that. A specular transmission is similar to a specular reflection. So it's, it's shiny, but instead of it being a shiny outside where light bounces off of it and is very polished, this is light that passes through it and it's passing through a smooth surface. So it's not gonna look very rough. Now in the Pixar surface material, we achieve this with the glass section. So let me actually just uh, redraw that. I'm just gonna put it over both bottles, I think for right now. And um, we have under glass, we have a refraction gain and reflection gain. So the, the names of the attributes are a little different. You no, know, we're talking about transmission, but we don't really see the name transmission down here. We see refraction, but uh, refraction, what it's talking about is basically a transmission. Uh, typically when you see the word refraction, um, which is similar to reflection, it's just referring to light that's passing through the surface. Uh, but in this case, we're referring to a specular transmission. So if I bring up the refraction gain, if you just watch the surface, when I boost this up, You'll see that it kind of almost has like a um, uh, like a tinted window effect, uh, kind of like you tint your car window, and you can tell you're looking through it because you can actually see like the uh, back side of this little uh, part of the uh, balcony railing showing up. You can see the uh, the door a little bit. Um, it's kind of blurry, but it's there. If I boost it all the way up, you can see that it's relatively clear, right? So we're sort of seeing through with pretty decent clarity to what's behind it. Uh, you'll notice something interesting though, where it almost looks like it's kind of fuzzy as it goes to the back. So remember, just like up here when we were talking about the specular reflection, how I was moving that roughness slider and we were getting like really low roughness was like that, you know, that mirror effect where it's very, very polished. And if I, as I boosted it up, it got really blurry and kind of had like a diffuse reflection look because it was, we're again, defining it as a rougher surface, it's the same thing here. So you're gonna see a lot of these overlapping concepts. So once you kind of understand what roughness does, um, you really can apply that pretty much anywhere. So roughness in this case, if I boost it up, watch the light passing through it. Let's actually go down to zero first. See how it's like really sharp? Like you, can, you can clearly see a lot of detail behind it. It's not very uh, blurry. 
If I boost this up, look what happens to everything behind it. It's just getting kind of fuzzy. It will keep doing that. If you keep boosting this up, you are now causing the light to pass through it. So light from behind the bottle, you know, the stuff bouncing off the door, or if this door was open, coming from the interior, passing through here, it is now blurring. And just kind of looking at this, I'm sure most of you looking at this probably have like a rough idea. Oh, I like that. Have a rough idea about roughness. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Uh, you have a rough idea of... Uh, what this would feel like and what, what it represents. Doesn't this kind of feel like frosted glass? Um, we Some of you, you may even have it um, at home for like a sliding shower door. Uh, you've probably seen uh, plenty of like ornaments that have that kind of rough glass effect where like some areas are polished and have like a really interesting like kind of ornate design, but the sections around it are very rough. That's basically what we're doing right here. So we're defining it as being rough, and you can see as they keep going, it just gets blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. And eventually, if you keep going, it almost gets to the point where you're blurring the, the light so much that you really can't even make out what's behind it. Um, but it is still technically passing through it. So this is extremely rough. And you can see it doesn't really feel like glass anymore. Uh, it looks like you're looking at a very gritty, kind of weird, transparent surface. Okay, so let's kind of bring this back a little bit. We'll come back down to like, uh, we'll do point one again, like a default. So this is just defining light passing through it. Now, the interesting thing down here with glass is that we also have a reflection gain. So the, the big thing that's kind of preventing this from feeling 100% like glass is you can see like there's a lot of black and it doesn't seem like there's any light bouncing off the outside. Glass is made up of two things. There is light that passes through it, but as you guys know, if you look at a glass bottle, it's reflecting light off the surface, right? We can we look that up super quick. Look up a glass bottle. Let's go to images. Uh, let's find something that's maybe not uh, on a white background. Uh, like, yeah, all these are pretty good. This is actually it's pretty decent right here. So there is light passing through it from behind it. Uh, it has liquid, which is a whole other discussion of nested dielectrics and how the two surfaces interact. But notice how on the outside, you can see the reflection of the window. That is a reflection, right? That's a specular reflection. That's what we did earlier. So we know that materials are made up of multiple things. It's not just, this is only a diffuse reflection. This is only a specular reflection. That does happen occasionally with something like a mirror, but almost everything is a combination of a few different uh, material properties. So in this case, we're getting a specular reflection layering over a specular transmission. So th that's really what we're missing here. We're missing the specular reflection. And that's why we have reflection gain. So this is the intensity of the refracted or transmitted light. This is the intensity of our reflected light. And so I'm just going to boost this all the way up to 100%. And you can see as soon as I do that, it's like night and day difference. You're like, oh, wow, this is incredible. We've made glass. We have reached the pinnacle of CG animation. And you're correct. Uh, this is it. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> just, just kidding. Um, but we're, we've now created glass, and it really is that easy. And I know in the preset browser, um, you guys have noticed there's a bunch of different materials already in there. RenderMan has you stocked with so many different types of transmissive materials from, like, whiskey to... Uh, soap bubbles with the glass and frosted glass, but it's really important to always know how you how do you create this stuff from scratch so you don't have to rely on a preset, and that's how you do it. Um, again, as long as you make a new material, uh, let's actually start this over real quick. Let's say we want to make a brand new Pixar surface. We would come down here to glass and crank these bad boys up one and one. Now I do want to show you one issue though that happens quite a bit because um, a lot of new uh, 3D artist will remember, okay, I go down to glass because I'm making glass. I crank these up. And we're going to do that again on a new material. And you can tell it works. But if you just look at the render, doesn't that feel like something's just a little off? Why does this look a little different? So it has a weird smoky look to it, right? What happened? What did we forget to do? It's nothing wrong down here. What you're seeing is, again, because this 
materials made up of multiple lobes. And lobes really just mean, um, they're sort of like the different uh, segments that make up of a material that define how it reacts with light. And they can all be combined together, like primary specular and diffuse, and diffuse reflection combined with subsurface. All these add together to, commit, to create the final result. The reason why this looks a little different this time is because even though I did crank these up, and it's, it's kind of acting like glass, remember how these materials always start with a diffuse reflection that's just a gray color? You're seeing the effect of the gray diffuse color because it's still there mixing with the transmission that we did with the glass and the reflection. So it's kind of getting a combination of a couple of different things all at once. We know glass doesn't have diffuse reflection. Because remember, diffuse reflection is the opaque color of the surface. Like um, uh, right now I'm sitting obviously at, at my laptop, I'm looking at it at the moment. So the laptop has that kind of like dark gray um, uh, kind of you know, plastic material. That grayish black color, that's the diffuse reflection. Glass doesn't really do that. Light just either passes through it or bounces off the surface as a specular reflection. So this means this area up here would be zero. There should not really be any diffuse. You can either put the gain to zero, put the color to black. It's all the same thing. Either way, you're just trying to kill this area so it doesn't do anything. So all the information is coming from here. Now, um, you may be also thinking, well, if that's the case, you know, if we're saying that the glass doesn't have any color, well, how the heck do you get colored glass? So like right here, for example, we have a couple examples in like our little image search where we are getting colored glass, right? This is a brown bottle. Here's a green bottle. Like we know glass has different tones. It's not just clear. Well, the color isn't coming from here. The color is still a transmission effect, but it's when the light passes through it, certain uh, parts of the, uh, of the uh, color spectrum are essentially just being uh, absorbed and they never really make it through the bottle. So it's kind of like eliminating certain colors from ever passing through hitting our eyes. And so it sort of changes what might have been initially a white light into sort of tinting into different tones. But if you want to change the color for glass, uh, you don't do it up here. You're still doing it in the same area. You're just doing it with that color slider, refraction color. So it's all in the same little pocket. Now I am going to boost this up to, we'll pick kind of a random color. Like let's say we're trying to do uh, like this kind of typical brown beer bottle. So you might think, okay, like I kind of know what that looks like. We're going to do that. We'll click. And I'm just going to sort of guess right now, you know, we need to be kind of in this like reddish orange. It needs to be richer and darker, right? I'm trying to get like a match to what I visually saw in the search. And I'm not looking too much at the render. I'm just kind of like looking at what's happening here. And I'm probably a little, need to be a little warmer, most likely, maybe a bit more saturated. I, mean, I know you guys are probably looking at the render and you can see that something doesn't look very good. So I've, what I feel like I've done is I've tried to like color match to the best of my ability, you know, for the lecture what I think it should be. Like this brown looks like that brown. And then you look at the render and you're wondering what the hell just happened? Why am I not getting the same information? Something's wrong, right? It must be broken. It's not broken. So it still looks actually really cool. I kind of, sometimes you end up with these little happy accidents where it still looks awesome. And you're like, damn, I don't even care about the brown beer bottle. This looks amazing. We're doing this now. Uh, but the reason it's doing this is because um, you have to remember that the color and the, the amount of light that's sort of absorbed that doesn't pass through is based on the thickness of the material. It's sort of like, I use this in one of my videos, a really good example of this would be like, um, if you look at, uh, hold up. like a bottle of Coca-Cola, like we'll kind of pull this guy up. And I'm gonna do another search here real quick. We're gonna do, puddle of coke. I really hope I don't get the wrong type of coke. Yeah, that's actually pretty good right here. Um, so this is Coca-Cola. Thank God we got the right image search. This could have been a very inappropriate meeting. Um, so this is both coke, right? They're both the same thing. Why does this look black? But we know if it's here, we get that very kind of light brownish tan color. It's the same material, but visually they look very, very different. And I, 
we all know what the reason it's doing this. It's because of the density of the material, right? This is a very thin puddle as opposed to it being in a two liter bottle. But you're, what you're seeing is that little simple observation that we're so used to seeing. Uh, that is exactly what we're seeing in the render. We're forgetting that the material has a thickness to it. And because we don't really, um, we haven't really taken the time to like change any of the, of the values and how it multiplies with the light. We just color corrected it. It's obviously tinting it way, way too far. We're getting almost a completely black color and pretty much only the red channels making it through with probably a little bit of green. So really what I'm getting at is when you color pick, you're not going to get the right color initially unless you're doing a thin uh, refraction. Uh, most of the time, because there's a thickness to it, the surface has double sides. It's, you know, it's, it's not a piece of paper. It's got some volume. It's going to look darker than you expect it. Now, the good news is it's really easy to fix this. Um, sometimes you just have to look at the surface and just adjust the color until it matches. So what I would recommend you guys do if you see it looks a little bit weird, you know, look at your reference. We'll say, you know, maybe uh, I want something kind of closer to, uh, I think I lost my search for the other one. Okay, here we go, like this guy, right? I want something closer to that. We're gonna click. And what I wanna do, um, when I pick this color, if I go back to RGB zero to one, we're trying to avoid having uh, many of these sliders, in this case, the blue channel, get really close to zero. Um, cause this is a multiplier. And basically what this is doing is this really dark blue that's kind of wide, this looks like a brown, is causing the light to just get obliterated. The blue light is not going anywhere. That's killing the value. So as long as you kind of know that it all comes back to math and numbers, um, really the trick here is just reducing saturation and boosting the value. So as I boost value up, you're gonna notice that it starts to lighten a little bit, right? Now it's not perfect. You'll notice it's very rich, but we're starting to get a little bit more light that's passing through it. So if we come back here again, my issue is I would say this is almost too rich, but we know what that is because HSV, hue saturation value, this is an issue with saturation. It's too red. So I'm hoping if we simply pull saturation down, we can ease back on how much that's affecting the render. I'm gonna pull it back, pull it back. Let's keep going. You can see how touchy this is. We're getting into like pastels and look how strong that color still is in the render. Okay, now let's look at this. Same thing, let's bring it back. Now it's sometimes hard to get a perfect match because this is also a bottle against a white background. This is a bottle against a dark gray. So they're not gonna look exactly correct. And I think my hue is a little off. I'm probably a bit too far into red. So I need a little more yellow, but I'm kind of dancing around the right answer. Like if I'm too red, I just need to go this way. So maybe we would try like 20 uh, for your hue, just to kind of uh, kind of shift almost toward the green. And that's um, probably getting a little bit closer. So that is us tinting the refractions with color. And again, even if you put a color on here, you can still add roughness. You can define how rough the surface looks. If I go to like 0.5, we're now creating a rougher uh, brown bottle. So it's kind of has that smoky look, but it's definitely really cool looking. I'm sure you can imagine too, just by uh, doing a couple of real simple adjustments here with like color and the roughness, you can create um, all sorts of really interesting types of like gemstones. Um, I've had a couple situations where I've sort of combined uh, effects from the glass lobe with the subsurface to do um, different types of like amethyst, uh, uh, rubies, things where it almost feels like it's kind of like a combo of two different things. It's not just glass, but it has like a little bit of like weird uh, diffuse transmissions going on at the same time. So you can get kind of creative with how you uh, mix and match some of this stuff. But for now, let's just kind of put this back to point two. And uh, I might just lighten this up just a tiny bit so I can see through it a little more. Okay, we'll do something kind of like this. I like that. Let's actually go down to like 0.15. All right. So I'm gonna do this again a little bit faster this time to show you uh, how quick this is. We're gonna do a different color on this one. Once you get comfortable with this, it, it's gonna go by much quicker. We're gonna click on the bottle, right click, picks our surface. And I should be naming these, by the way. I have not been naming any materials. Uh, bad Jared, but we would name the material up at the top. We're not gonna do it because we're feeling rebellious. We're gonna drop all the diffuse down like we saw before. Um, 
remember how the we have this issue sometimes where the selection highlighting shows up in the viewport? How do we fix it? In the viewer, if you notice your render man uh, renderer is showing you the selection. Sometimes it's weird. This doesn't always happen, but uh, in some versions of Maya and render man, it still does this. Go to show selection highlighting. You can disable the viewport from showing you any highlighting. And now it doesn't show up. I can click on things still, and you can see it's changing what I'm selecting because it's kind of hopping around in the outline or in the attribute editor. But I'm not seeing that little selection thing pop up. So crank it, crank these guys up. We're going to do a different one. Uh, it's completely clear, but maybe this time we do more of like an aqua. We'll kind of find like a very subtle. And again, I'm not trying to push it very far because it's very, very touchy. Maybe th even that's too much. We'll do like a saturation of 0 0.1. It almost looks white, uh, but you can see uh, it is much more noticeable uh, in the render. And we'll leave this at, at 0.1 in this case. Pretty cool, right? So very, very easy to do this stuff. Um, once you get a little bit faster at it, and you kind of get comfortable with uh, what all the settings do. Okay, now for your project, um, I'll show you here the activity. Now, what you guys basically have done at this point is like the uh, the arch, the railing. You've done some different, uh, mat you know, material colors for like the uh, the paint. Um, and uh, you know the telescope, a lot of the opaque surfaces, but you haven't done any lighting on the inside. You haven't done any of the glass, and uh, even on the doors, the glass and doors is actually hidden at the moment in your project. So we want to make sure we unhide that, and we're going to do it as well. But one of the other big things with this project is uh, that we've also included uh, lights on the inside. Oh, actually, this is not the right image. This is after I added the candles. My bad. I forgot I moved the assignments around. Sorry. Let's close out of that. This is actually one assignment uh, too late. The Yeah, this is the one I should have been showing you guys. So we haven't got to the candles yet. It's everything else but uh, the candles and the, the vase. But the main thing is you're seeing we're also adding light. So kind of harking back to what we did uh, in the first shading and lighting class, I want you guys to take what you've already been given for the lighting, Think about the materials you've created and see if you can kind of come up with something a little more unique where we're maybe kind of pushing and pulling some different ideas with how we can introduce light into this shot. So you have creative freedom to uh, create your own lights. Uh, you can do interior lighting with really bold colors. You could do some exterior lighting. You could do a little kicker below that's like accenting the side of the balcony. Um, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. I just want you guys to have fun and kind of uh, use the, the tools you've learned before and try to come up with something uh, pretty interesting. And if you end up doing a couple versions of the lights, I would love to check it out. So these are the ones I did, uh, but you don't have to match any of this stuff. It is totally up to you. <coughs> Excuse me. One second. I need a little bit of a drink break. Okay. So let's kill that. And I'm going to show you um, a couple ways to add light. And then we're going to look into a few final things with the bottles over here. So how do we add light? Well, when you get to the point where you want to add light in here, uh, if you just look at the, the way the scene is set up, you'll notice that currently, uh, let me turn that selection highlighting back on, uh, currently the shutters are preventing us from seeing on the inside. But remember that this project is made up of groups. Now I'm not saying there's really absolutely nothing in here to look at. It's uh, extremely boring, but we want to open these up anyway, so we can kind of play around with some interior lighting. So what we would do is click on the shutter, and I want to find the group. Now remember, there's a shortcut to find a group without digging through all this, this different stuff in the outliner. Click on your object, hit the up arrow. That will navigate up one hierarchy in the outliner. So you're basically, when you hit up, I'm jumping from you click on it, this object, when I hit up, watch what, whoops, come on, move out of the way, help tool. Watch what happened over here. I hit up, see what hopped up to this guy. So I'm selecting the parent or the group that that object was in. So if you kind of organize your scenes properly, a lot of times you don't have to go digging through these to find the right thing. So we hit up, E, I can now rotate. So we're going to open this up a little bit. 
and we'll grab this guy up, grab the little green curve. We're going to open this guy up as well. Okay, so the latch is, for some reason, already been rotated. Uh, I can't see it. Oh, that's already been rotated down. I guess I already did this before. And if I go back to my test cam, you can see uh, that we actually are able to see inside now. So if I do a quick render, uh, we should be able to see something uh, inside of this thing. Yep, there's our dark interior. It's no longer the shutter just butting up against uh, the other door. Now, where is the window, right? Because there's not a window here. Let's just go back to perspective. Currently, there is no window. It's just a bunch of holes. Over here, window glass layer. You'll notice when I turn this display layer on, it becomes opaque. So this is unhiding the window geometry. So I'm going to go to 4 so you can see this. See there's something turning visible. Um, if you click on these two, I'm holding shift and go to wireframe. You actually can see the shape of it. It's just sort of um, uh, embedded into the, uh, the frame here a little bit. But there's the two window panes. They're very, very basic. It's just essentially like a, a couple poly cubes. Uh, my finest modeling yet. Uh, and we're going to put a material on it. So let's do that super quick. It's going to be easy. Two things here. We're going to keep it like a very simple glass. We're not going to overcomplicate it. So I get them selected, right click on the Pixar surface, apply it. I'm going to do this blind. We're not even going to render it. We're going to go to the material, kill the diffuse completely. We're going to go down to glass, crank these guys up. And I'm going to leave this as just like a regular clear glass with like a little bit of roughness. So really I'm just bu bumping those up and that's it. But uh, even if I hit render now, I know it's going to look like glass. Yeah, it's already working. Um, you can see right here we're getting some reflections. Yeah, it's doing its thing. Now, once we add a light on the inside, it's going to be a lot easier to really see that it's working because you'll, you're going to see a light inside that's actually passing through it. So we can do that pretty quick. Uh, let's hide this. We're going to do a split view. Let's do our test cam. We're going to make this perspective. Okay, we'll just wide this out a little bit. And how about we do, let's do a disc light. Um, I like the disc light. So we're going to do a disc light. I'm going to hit W. And you can see the disc light, just like everything with this project, is already inside. Everything gets created on the interior by default. Because that's where the, uh, remember, that location thing is keep popping in. That just happens to be the origin of the scene. That's coordinate 0, 0, 0. So I've created the light. We're going to go in the light properties under advanced. Turn on normalize. Uh, so normalize, you guys might remember this from the first class. This is that checkbox we used. So when you scale a light up, it doesn't become brighter. Um, I, I think as an artist, it's just easier to keep this turned on so you're not constantly fighting with uh, the scale uh, affecting how bright you're trying to make something. Uh, it's a little bit of a back and forth that you're fighting with that guy. So we're going to keep it on. Hit R. Boost it up. Uh, it's going through the ground. Let's just move it up a little bit. And I think it should be going outside. I'm going to try to get a little bit of an angle because I want to see if we can get some interesting shadows against that side right there. I did this in one of my example renders. I think it was the red one. So I'm just going to kind of blast it that way. Let's turn on the render and I I don't know if we're going to see it yet because it's still... Yeah, I don't think we can see it yet, but I'm pretty sure if we boost this guy up, it will show up. And I'm going to pick a pretty bold color here. Let's we're going purple, buddy. Deep purple. Let's do that. Now, I, I this should show up. It's going to be very easy to see it because when you see purple, it's it's working. Uh, let's do five. I don't see it yet. Let's do ten. Ah, oh, there we go. So sometimes when you're doing this, um, it does take a little trial and error to eventually get to the point where you can see the light. Uh, so if you're using exposure, remember that every time you go up one value, you are effectively doubling the intensity. So from 0 to 1, it's twice as bright. From 1 to 2, it's then twice as bright as again. So it keeps getting brighter, it's like times 2, times 2, times 2. So I've, this is really, really intense, but it's still just based on the scene scale. Even that brightness is barely enough to show up. It's a very, very subtle hint, which could be cool for some of you guys, depending on what effect you want to go for. Like I still think... I like it. But if I want to get something a bit more interesting where it's hitting out here and maybe 
interacting with the telescope, a couple other pieces, we are going to go a little brighter. Let's go up to like a 12. Now we're getting somewhere. Now, the tricky part about doing interior lighting is you're sort of in this little bit of a dance where you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I get the light to hit the right area, not hit other areas where you don't want it, and also get maybe the, the right type of shadow effect. So currently what's happening is it's fighting with these two shutters a little bit. It's really bright here, and I don't know if I want it to be that bright. So you might actually play around with like the rotation a little bit as you kind of work on the lighting. Like I might say, well, let me just open this up more. Okay, it gets brighter. If I go, whoops, if I go this way, okay, it gets darker. So maybe I like that more. And I want to see more hitting the side. So maybe I should take this shutter. E, open this up a little more. Now, we can also trick some things too, because keep in mind, like if I was using this camera as my final shot, if I can't see the shutter, does it really need to be there? Maybe not, because all it's really doing now is blocking the light, and I'm, I kind of don't want it to, because I want to see if I can hit that part of the wall. So a lot of times what you'll notice with, um, with a lot of uh, different animation projects, because everything is really focused on what the viewer is going to see, there's all sorts of little tricks that they're going to do outside of the field of view um, that maybe aren't physically correct, but they're doing it just to get the right look. So is there supposed to be a shutter here? Sure. Do we need it for the shot? No. It's blocking light. So I might just hide the whole group with H. And what that's going to do is allow a bit more light to pass through here without being occluded by the object. So we're, we're just doing a couple little tricks. We, we wouldn't see the shutter anyway, so let's just kill it. Now, one th thing, too, is kind of interesting is the light scale is going to have a pretty big effect on how the light interacts with the material out here. Um, let me boost this up a bit brighter um, so you can see this. We're going to go to, like, let's go to 13. It might go to, like, 14 or 15 because I really want this to pass through it. There we go. So I'm getting some really intense color. It actually looks kind of awesome. Um, but notice how I'm not seeing many kind of cool shadow patterns. And in one of the examples over here, you can kind of see these really faint lines I'm getting where it's passing through those little, uh, the different boards that make up uh, the, the door. So what causes the shadows to soften and blur? It's all based on the scale of the light. So in this case, because I just have the light scaled really big, we're getting a lot of overlap, like penumbra and umbra, where the light is kind of crisscrossing on top of itself from so many different angles that it's just blurring the heck um, out of the shadow lines. So simply by scaling it down and making it smaller, look what happens. Look what we get. So now because we've made the light tinier, um, it's still basically the same intensity. You know, we didn't move it. We didn't really change much. We just made it smaller. And you can see now we're getting some really interesting shadow details um, that maybe you know, based on the our art director or a supervisor or, you know, whatever, whoever is looking at this stuff, um, we might decide that, hey, you know, this is a little more prominent. I'm kind of digging it because I feel like it really pushes your eye into this back pocket, which is where we want to lead the viewer into the next shot. It's a good way to, like, put our focus here because we're creating a little more detail and uh, texture from the light source. And we're just kind of playing around with shadows uh, doing it that way. So really cool stuff. So there's our lighting, right? But remember too, this wouldn't have ever worked if we didn't create the glass surface because if these two guys right here, if those windows were opaque and I just had it with like a regular Pixar surface, the glass, this light would have never made it outside. The glass is what's allowing light to pass through it to hit this part of the scene. It's transmissive. So it's all kind of coming full circle. We're making transmissive materials to get the material to look right, and we're making transmissive materials to allow the light to do what we want. So you can use these in uh, many, many different ways. So um, hopefully this has been pretty helpful so far. Uh, the last thing I want to show you guys real quick are just a couple of things we can do to the glass bottles. I'm going to do a few different examples here of uh, something called a roughness map which is a little more advanced, but I do want you guys to see this because I love roughness maps. And we're going to show you a bump map. A bump map is very similar to a normal map, and that's something you guys have actually uh, just finished for one of the previous assignments. So let's just kill the render for a second. Let's 
let's do let's do the bump map first because that's kind of similar to something you've already done. So if we go over here and we don't need our puddle of coke anymore, let's I'll show the normal map one more time so you uh, have kind of a frame of reference. So this is a, a normal map. This is the thing that you guys literally uh, just created at the end of week two and you, you applied it at the beginning of week three. So you guys remember that a normal map is basically sort of this little illusion thing where it's faking surface details that technically don't really exist. So instead of you, um, like for this surface, actually it's water, instead of you physically sculpting water, I mean, imagine how dense this stuff would have to be to do that. Uh, instead, you're faking it through a texture. Uh, you're applying this little map that sort of uses uh, red, green, blue values to, to decipher or determine um, how the normal angle bends to create these little faked bump effects. So the thing that you guys did was actually kind of similar to this, where you had like a stone and you converted that stone texture to something like this in Photoshop. Um, but it's a color map, right? It's bending the normal to give the illusion of surface imperfections. They're, it's very easy to find a ton of information about normal maps all over the place. A bump map is a little different, but they do a very, very similar effect. And um, when I first started doing uh, you know, 3D animation, I actually used a bump map first uh, before a normal map. I, did, I had no clue what a normal map was when I first started doing this stuff, but I knew what this meant. Uh, bump map is typically going to be uh, black and white. Uh, like These are actually all pretty good. Uh, bump maps also can kind of get mixed up with something called a height map. Um, you're going to learn about that when you get to Digital Painting 2, or you, when you start working with Painter. Uh, that's another awesome software. I might actually show you guys Painter uh, next week. But... Um, but maps are going to be height. So you know how the normal map was color, and it's sort of uh, kind of faking how the surface bends in different directions? But map is sort of a more primitive version of that, where instead of it using three channels to define how you bend um, the direction of a surface, this is almost more of like a weird trick where you're sort of just pushing the surface up and down. So think of it as kind of being like where it's black, the surface pushes in, where it's white, it pushes up and it uses contrast between the pickle, uh, the, wow, the pickles. It uses contrast between the pickles. All right, that's in the recording. <laughs> it uses contrast between the pixels to define how severe the height difference is between uh, the raised areas and lowered areas. But it's just a black and white map. Uh, these are very, very easy to generate uh, with Photoshop, almost any software. Uh, you can kind of create these pretty easily. So the reason I'm kind of showing you this is because uh, there's a couple things we can do in Maya to get some pretty interesting effects here uh, with bump maps. Uh, this actually might be going through the surface. Oh, yeah, a little bit. That's not a big deal. But um, we're going to make a faked bump map using a 3D procedural to give the glass a little bit of a waviness effect. So to do that, we're going to hop in the hypershade. And I really should have named these. I'm actually now regretting that. Uh, this is going to be... Uh, let's do brown bottle, material, let's see, this is, uh, it's kind of like a aqua bottle, I guess. All right, and there are windows back here. I can't even spell aqua. Jeez, there we go. So uh, we're going to click in the this guy here. So this is my aqua bottle, uh, which is that. And I want to graph the material out in the node graph down here. So we're going to hold down my right mouse button, uh, gesture down to graph network, boom, there's a material. And we have this little guy next to it, that's the shading group. So uh, this is the thing connecting it to the geometry. But what we want to do is connect something into the material, kind of like you guys were doing before where you were um, you know, using little like file textures and you're loading in like your color maps, your uh, your normal maps. Well, I guess with the normal map, you're doing that with the... Uh, the Pixar normal map node, not this guy, but it's the same idea. Now, th the difference here with this one is instead of us loading in a texture file from something that we found online or created in Photoshop, I am going to fake it with a procedural. So we're going to delete that. I'm going to hold down right mouse button and go up to create node. Now, you guys might have this already here if it's in the le on the left side of the uh, hypershade. It just kind of depends if... Um, 
if you've already modified the hypershade like I do in my videos. But this is the creation window. Um, you can, I get to it just by right clicking in the node graph and uh, going up to this. So uh, once you're in here, uh, we have all these different things we can create. And I'm actually going to go to the Maya 3D textures. And I'm going to do this kind of the old school way I was taught uh, many, many years ago. I'm going to pick this thing called a solid fractal. So this is a 3D texture. And a 3D texture is a little bit different. Um, 2D textures are probably pretty easy for everybody to wrap their head around. Like this could be a 2D texture. Uh, it is basically just um, an image. So uh, it's two dimensions, uh, U and V, or width and height. Uh, 3D texture is different though, uh, hence why it's called 3D. There's three dimensions. So it's based actually in X, Y, Z uh, coordinate space. So uh, it's all, this one's, it's kind of a hard one to explain, but you can almost imagine like a 3D texture as being a cloud of color everywhere. Like imagine you're standing in a fog and depending on where you are in the fog, you pick up different parts of the texture on your skin. So you're kind of moving through a three-dimensional texture and where it happens to overlap with your skin, that is the color your skin picks up. So it's a, kind of a weird concept, but uh, that's basically what it's doing. Now, the reason I kind of like using 3D textures uh, for something like this is 3D textures don't need to use UVs. Um, UVs have this little issue where you're worrying about texture seams, which is kind of annoying at times. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that with this guy. So I've got a solid fractal, and I need to connect it to uh, our global bump. This is the same thing you guys used for your normal map back in the previous week. Uh, actually, sorry, not back in the previous week. You used it like a couple days ago. Uh, so I need to make a bump 3D node to connect this properly. So I'm going to use tab. I'm going to type in bump. I'm going to make a bump 3D. This is also in, in the videos, by the way, so it's not just me doing it in the lecture. I'm going to make a bump 3D, and I need to go from here to here, and then here to down there. So bump value, you can see if I connect, it's like, oh, it doesn't like the color. It's graying it out. But if I do out alpha, it connects. Because out alpha is a single channel. Uh, bump value is a single channel. So it just wants to take one channel to another single channel, one output to one input. Now, since I'm doing an out alpha, uh, one thing I always like to do, just to kind of play it safe, because I've been scarred in the past, is anytime I do an alpha output, I always like to have alpha is luminance turned on from the node it's coming from. Um, it's not necessarily always something you need to do. I've just been burned by this so many times uh, that I've almost just turned it on by autopilot. But basically what this is doing is it's sort of like saying, if you're going to pull the alpha channel from something, if this is enabled, instead of it looking for an alpha channel, because you know how some textures have an alpha channel, like it's RGBA, occasionally you deal with a, a texture that doesn't have an alpha channel, but this needs it. And so when you turn this on, it's sort of like taking the color information and then cramming that into an alpha channel. That's kind of what we're doing. It's You don't really have to worry about it, but if you just turn it on, uh, it'll work. Now for the bump, this goes to bump normal. So that's gonna be easy, out normal, click, bump normal, boom, done. Now, I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to leave it like this for now. And I bet we are already going to see it's working. This is pretty simple to set up. It probably seems complicated now because it's the first time you've seen it, but you're going to be able to do these very, very quick. So it's definitely working. You can see something very weird has happened to our glass. So let's do a crop. We're going to draw over the bottle. Let that update just in that one section. Turn the crop off. Okay. Let's go back here and figure out what the hell happened. So it's working. The problem is it's working too well. And it's kind of cool because, again, sometimes when you do, you start playing around with materials and lights and texture connections, you will just sort of create these, uh, these beautiful things you didn't even mean to do. Like this actually kind of looks awesome the way it is. Now, it's not maybe what I wanted, but we kind of sort of, accidentally created this really interesting like uh, almost like a cracked glass or like gr glass that has broken up been, been broken apart and kind of fused back together but the reason it's doing that is because even though we have the, this whole bump thing connected properly we haven't told the material how intense the bump is so it's almost treating the bump uh, details like they're massive craters in the surface it's just 
uh, absolutely obliterating the light. It's being bent everywhere. So that's why we have this bump 3D node. Um, it helps us convert the data, but really more importantly, it gives us a little slider here where we can change how intense the effect needs to be. So it's just sitting at one. This is uh, way too intense. So we'll cut it down to like 0.5. Like, what does that do? And I'm not saying it's, you know, where it needs to be, but you can already tell like, okay, it's starting to kind of shift back to something kind of reasonable. Now it almost has like a, like an aquatic look where it feels like it's kind of like a, a liquid surface. You can see all those little cool distortions there. Let's go to like 0.25, right? A little less bendy. Now if it's zero, it doesn't do anything. It's like our regular bottle. So it's kind of like this little bit of a, a balancing game where you're kind of figuring out how much you want to bend the surface. And there's all these things you can do too with the uh, procedural where you define like the frequency of the texture. Like, is, are there a lot of really tiny bumps? Is it very broad, uh, low frequency, larger bumps? And there's ways to kind of mix different procedurals together to get like different frequencies of detail. Um, I used to do this a lot when I was faking um, water, like animated water or uh, you know, pools, oceans. This is a really cheap way that we used to do this years ago. We'd kind of connect one of these into a surface and then you can animate it with an animated section. You can change all these little values and actually make, it'll look like the water is just kind of like churning and moving around. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. But I'm not going to get too much deeper into this at the moment. Uh, it still looks pretty awesome though. All right, let's kill that for a second. And the last thing we're going to show you real quick is a roughness map. Uh, this will be kind of our final hoorah before we get out of here. So let's right click over the bottle, uh, the brown one this time, and graph that one out. So let's look at the roughness map. So I'm going to go up here, type in roughness, roughness map. And I always like doing this because um, just by looking at these images, sometimes you can sort of figure out what it's doing, uh, you know, without even playing around with it inside of Maya. So uh, the first thing is just for the name roughness map, you have to kind of, you could sort of piece two and two together. What is a roughness map? It's simply a texture for roughness. So we see roughness for glass. We saw roughness up here for primary specularity. There is one for diffuse. That's this one's a little weird and different, um, but it's defining how rough the surface is. But remember, visually what we were seeing is how blurry is the light going to be when it reacts with it? Does it get diffused a lot where it scatters everywhere? Is it low roughness where it's very crisp and passes right through it, polished or dry? That's really what it comes down to. But remember when we were doing the bottle, when I defined roughness earlier, I'm just moving a slider, right? I didn't say that, well, it is rough, but what if I want it to be kind of rough up here, but then not very rough at the bottom? Like, shouldn't there be variation? Do you have to have one value across the whole surface? And you do not. That's exactly why we're talking about the roughness map. Um, let's see if I can find a good example of one where it's really easy to see it. I can't, yeah, I did this in my last lecture, but this probably is really one of the better ones that pops up. This is a roughness map. And you can kind of, it doesn't show me it here, but you can kind of see where the highlight is sort of sharp and it kind of looks wet and then it gets very soft around it. Um, let me see if I can find one where it shows you the map. Yeah, this one might work actually. Oh, geez. We're getting to some deep stuff now. Yeah, metal roughness. There's the roughness map. So it, it's black and white. And if you compare this to the image over here, see how the areas where it has that kind of metal look, it just looks a little shinier. But notice how the rust looks rougher. Like there's just a different feel to it. That's this guy. So darker is low roughness. White is high roughness. So if we do a search, we could do, let's do something like, um, uh, oh, that's kind of fun. It's Marmoset. And my internet is totally dead. Oh, yeah, you guys might notice the stream just cuts off there for a second. I'm back. Um, yeah, what I'm doing right now is I'm just looking for a roughness map. So I just typed it into Google. Uh, before the stream died. And let's see here. 
it doesn't really, these are all fine. It's not really going to matter a whole lot. Uh, we'll do, oh, that is tiny. We'll just do a dirt texture. I can probably make one pretty quick. That's probably fine. Even this one's okay. It, anything like this is honestly going to work. I just want something that's kind of black and white that shows me some pretty good surface variation. Uh, fine, we'll do this guy. Okay, so, oh, geez. No, let's see if I can do open image, a new tab. I want to find this thing. There it is. All right, we're going to save this thing in the source images folder uh, and just quickly connect that so you can see it. Uh, it's really cool, though, when you see it on the material. I, roughness maps are probably one of the single most important things you do for a shader. Uh, we'll call this glass roughness. So it's a JPEG. Okay. So it's not even a square texture. Uh, normally what I would do in this case is I would go into Photoshop and I'd, I'd make a new canvas, define my resolution. Is it a 2048? Crop this into the 2048. It's a kind of like we did before. We're pressed for time. We're not going to do any of that stuff. So we're going to kind of skip ahead a little bit. Um, I have the texture here. I'm just going to quickly make a file note, connect it in, and we're just going to see what it looks like. So let's make a file texture. We're going to click on file, hit the folder, and there's my glass roughness, right, because I set my project. Very easy to find this stuff pretty quickly. And now that I've got it here, um, I want to connect it into the right property. So there's, if you look at the materials inputs, you can see there's quite a few different roughnesses. There's our specular roughness. Um, there's a rough specular roughness, but if you kind of come down here far enough, you will see glass roughness. So this guy right here is that one right there. So you do want to be careful sometimes that you're connecting it into the right uh, attribute. And you'll typically know if it works because let's say that you connected it into a roughness, but you weren't sure. Like I'm going to kind of purposely screw this up. Okay, we'll do out alpha. So see how the alpha one is going to work again because roughness is a single channel. So it's kind of like the previous thing we did with the bump map. Color won't work, right? It says no. But I'm going to say we connect it here. We're like, nailed it. It's a roughness. Now, it's not going to do anything in the render. And if you look back here, see how the roughness attribute can still be moved? There's nothing here that tells me something is connected. I can still move this slider around. But if I come up, look what happened to this area. This roughness has something. I put it in the wrong attribute. So I'm going to right click, break connection. You can also just click on the curve and delete it. Let's try it again. Out alpha to glass roughness. Whoops. There we go. And because it's an alpha, let's do the same thing I did before with the procedural alpha's luminance turned on. Okay. It might already be working. Let me just turn this off and turn it back on because it needs to make that .txt file. Yeah, I think it's doing it. It might be a little hard to see it, but I'm almost positive it's already working. Okay, I'm going to boost the contrast on it so you can see it, but there is variation. And one thing that's kind of helpful too, sometimes when you're rendering, you're having, you'll have a little bit of a difficult time visualizing where the texture is lining up. Like you can kind of see it, right? There is something there. Um, I'll show you a little bit of a trick here to see this a little easier. Um, so on the file node, I'm trying to see it on the model so I know if it's even like applying it properly. There's a little button here on the file node that has an S, uh, like an S symbol. Now it's not Superman. This is solo. So when you click this, and if I turn textures on in the viewport, it'll actually show you what this one thing looks like on the bottle. And you can tell there definitely is something there. Now, one thing I actually forgot to do uh, uh, that I need to do for this case is because it's a black and white map, um, I have to do this one extra thing here where I set the color space to raw. Um, this is a whole other deep discussion we're not going to have time to get into today, but just take my word for it. This has to be set to raw color space. This will make more sense when you get to digital painting too. Um, but we're putting it to raw, and I can tell it's there. What I'm going to do is just increase the contrast. You know how like in Photoshop, you'd make like a levels or like a contrast adjustment layer, and you could kind of play around with like how dark and light something is? I'm just going to do that in Maya real quick. Um, we're going to do a remap uh, value. Um, this is just a kind of a really primitive uh, color correction node 
that Maya's had forever. Uh, whoever designed it, though, apparently got fired because it still looks exactly the same. I don't think this thing has changed in the 15 plus years I've been using the software. Uh, it's just t as terrible looking today as it was 15 years ago. So we're going to do al alpha into the input value, and I'm going to do output value into roughness. I'm basically just kind of plopping this in the middle of the chain so I can change the color before it gets to the material. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. Let me turn that texture off and then turn this back on. It, okay, if I crop this thing and mess around with a contrast, I think I can actually get this thing to show up. This is a, believe it or not, this is our contrast controller. Yes, it's a sloped like a linear curve. This is how stupid this thing is. It's done, it doesn't even show you contrast sliders for looking at this dumb thing. So we're going to move it over. And if I start nudging these guys next to each kind of closer, we should see. I might have gone too far with that guy. Where is it? There should be a little bit of very. Yeah, it's starting to happen here. You kind of have to get that sweet spot but we are getting a little bit of variation. Yeah, you can kind of see where it's like little bits and pieces are kind of shiny and then other areas are a bit rougher. The particular texture I'm choosing right here is probably not the best example. It didn't really have much detail to begin with, but I think you kind of get the idea. There's something now defining it. And just so you can kind of see um, what this could be used for, if you did a frosted glass window um, uh, basically, this stuff right here, this is a roughness texture. Uh, you're seeing it. Rough, right? We know what this feels like. This is really gritty. This is very smooth. This is achieved in Maya with a roughness map. So I already know what this would look like. So because this is rougher and that's very smooth, this would be a gray or a lighter gray. This pattern would be black. So as long as you can, in Photoshop, figure out how to generate the image of like the black kind of straight lines against this kind of like gray or lighter gray background color. If you put that on the material, assuming you, you know, made the object in Maya, um, it would it would do that. Uh, it would work pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so they're very easy to create and uh, utilize. So uh, they're pretty important. And the reason it's good for a bottle is because as soon as your hand touches a bottle, you've immediately transferred oil to the surface. You are making rougher sections just by touching the bottle you're, you're from your fingerprint. Um, so you can use fingerprints, you can use dirt stains and water stains and all sorts of different things just to break it up so it doesn't look too perfect. This image I used here is not the best example, but hopefully at least the concept is uh, translated pretty well in the lecture. So that's pretty much it. Um, we went a little bit over today, but uh, I thought it'd be kind of fun just to go over a few more advanced things, just to get you guys thinking about how we could use materials, how we could play with light, um, different ways we can use normal maps, roughness maps, and all the different things we're doing with the materials. You will, will be using this again when you get to digital painting too. So this is just kind of the first time you're being exposed to the co these uh, different concepts. It's gonna be something you reuse over and over again, all the way to the end of the program. So really cool stuff. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I do appreciate everybody hanging out, uh, whoever you were out there. I uh, hope you have a good night, and I will, uh, I'm sure, catch up with everybody next week for the final live session of Shading Lighting 2 uh, in week 4. All right, have a good night, guys.